Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to members of parliament. Welcome to the Minister of Education, Dr. Anders Rudolph Samuel and his support staff. Radio listeners, TV viewers, those following via social media and members of the media, good afternoon. Welcome to the continuation of this urgent public meeting uh, number 22 of today, Thursday, August 25th, 2022. I just said welcome to the urgent public meeting. It is good to note that this meeting is a continuation of the meeting which started in the parliamentary year 2021-2022. I would like to give a special welcome once again to the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, Dr. Andrew Rudolph Samuel, and his support staff. We have established a quorum of 10 members. Please stand for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. I have not received any notice of absence from members of parliament. And at this point in time, I ask if there are any notification from any member of parliament. I see there is none. The agenda points for this public meeting are the following. Insight and discussion into the role and authority of the Ministry of Education with regards to the religious and other alternative school boards on St. Martin. Agenda point two, the process regarding reporting of incidents involving school authority figures and students to the Ministry of ECYS. And this is in the in doc incoming document 1199 of the parliamentary year 2021-2022 and is dated August 16, 2022. This meeting was requested by the members of parliament, Melissa Gums, uh, Rian Peterson, and Solange Duncan Jr. We go over to the agenda points. On August 16th, 2022, Parliament received a letter from the MPs Melissa Gums, MP Rian Peterson, and MP Solange Duncan with a request for an urgent public meeting of Parliament with the above mentioned agenda points. The presence of the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports was requested as well. The meeting was convened on August 25th, 2022. During that meeting, upon request of the requesters of the meeting, both agenda points were merged to be handled simultaneously. The Minister of Education, Youth, Culture, and Sports, Dr. Anders Rudolph Samuel, gave a presentation and members of parliament posed questions to the minister in the first round. A brief, after a brief adjournment and closing remarks by the minister, the meeting was then adjourned to allow the minister time to prepare the answers to questions posed by members of parliament in the first round. Hence, the meeting today. Today, the minister has returned to parliament to provide the answers to the questions posed by members of parliament during the meeting of August 25th, 2022, in the first round as indicated. I will now give the floor to the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports, Dr. Anders Rudolph Samuel, to provide answers to the questions posed by members of parliament in the first round. And therefore, Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to you and good afternoon to the reveal. Good afternoon to the members of parliament. Good afternoon to my support staff. To my right, I have the 
Secretary General of the Ministry of ECYS, Education, College, Youth, and Sports, Ms. Sharina, Mrs. Shermina Powell Richardson, and to my left, I have the head of the Department of Culture, Ms. Clara Reyes. Good afternoon to everyone who is listening to us in the community of St. Martin, including the media and the people. Mr. Chairman, I am here to give the answers to the members of parliament, and I would like to begin with the question of the member of parliament, MP Rumu. The first question, is the minister aware if the, proto if the school board reported the incident to the court of guardian? No, the minister is not aware of that. Are you as minister going to report the incident to the court of guardianship? If not, do you have plans to do so? I contacted the authorities and they informed me that the case had been handled. Is there a reporting code established? No, a reporting code has not yet been established. If not, is it in process? If yes, how far along is this reporting code? The response to this question and to some other question, Mr. Chairman, would be sent to us either by the Ministry of Justice or the Ministry of VSR and who is responsible for that part of the answer. In the absence of a reporting code, what is the current reporting structure in the schools when it comes to a reporting of an abuse of any kind? According to Article 8 of the FBE ordinance, the competent authority, in this case the school board, should report any reasonable suspicion of a crime against morality or the offense of a serious assault within the sphere of a school under its authority to an investigative officer. Furthermore, if the school board has reasonable grounds to suspect that a person entrusted with duties on behalf of its school or other persons has committed physical violence towards a student, the school board shall immediately report this to an investigating officer. We also have that the uh, structure of for reporting of suspicion abuse and neglect was put in place by the Student Support Services in 2012. This structure outlines that if any staff working at the school suspects that a child is being abused and or neglected, they should report such to their school management who ensures the reporting to the court of guardianship. This should be done if they suspect that a child is being abused and or neglected. A student who wants to speak up in school may do so to a trusted person in school. For that child, it could be a teacher, a care team member, or even the canteen worker. The staff member now has an obligation to report this information to the care team so that it can be reported to the Court of Guardian, the Central Reporting Center. If a child wants to speak up, who is the first point of contact? The first point of contact for a child who is being abused should be an adult the child trusts. This could be someone from the school care team or a parent or guardian, a teacher or a coach, for example. With the alarming stats just mentioned, what has the ministry done in recent years regarding educating our students, parents, and administrators on reporting these type of incidents? Please elaborate on these efforts. The Department of Youth acts as a custodian in ensuring that children's rights on the island are enforced as per the United Nations Convention. On an annual basis, the department collaborates with youth stakeholders in raising the awareness of the Convention of the Rights of the Child in general, and also based on predetermined articles as focal themes. This awareness campaign is presented during the month of November in the form of panel discussions, radio interviews, sport interviews, and 
movie nights among others. What is the safety what is the status of the safety net project that was being carried out by the Department of Youth? A safety net policy framework was developed in 2020. The drafting of the safety net policy has been delayed due to the hiring process of a senior policy worker and a policy worker within the Department of Youth. However, we are committed to ensuring that once the hiring is completed, this process will continue. What is the status of the action plan child abuse that was started in 2015 and updated in 2019? 2019. Has it been finalized? If yes, can Parliament receive a copy? The guide towards the National Protocol Child Abuse, containing guidelines for the reporting and handling of child abuse, and the action plan child abuse was approved in May 2015 by the Council of Ministers. The action plan was updated in 2019 and has been provided to Parliament. The following question, what is the status of the integrated youth policy that is being worked on by the Department of Youth? The integrated youth policy 2020-2025, a shared vision to secure the future of the youth of St. Martin and the implementation plan have been approved on November 17, 2021. A copy of the integrated youth policy and the implementation plan has been provided to Parliament. The question, what contents of this policy addresses harassment and abuse of minors? Please outline in what context this policy addresses these issues. Mr. Chairman, the integrated youth policy framework sheds light on the development of the youth in St. Martin and provide guidance to policies and the development of programs for youth between the ages of 4 and 24. In order to achieve the best outcomes for the youth, it is imperative that a stable foundation is formed to, be, to build on. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child defines the basic human rights that are fundamental prerequisites for holistic youth development and therefore is applied as the vantage point for the integrated youth policy. The policy document explores the state of affairs of children on St. Martin through the following six clusters. One, civil rights and freedom. Two, family life and alternative care. Three, education and labor. Fourth, health and well-being. Five, culture and sport. Six, special protection measures. The strategic objectives are formulated to give directions to policies, legislation, and services that need to be in place to ensure the best outcomes for our youth. The cluster two, which is family life and alternative, and cluster six, which is special protection measures, specifically addresses harassment and abuse of minors in this policy. Question 11. What is the status of the policy for preventing domestic violence, child abuse, forced prostitution, trafficking in person, and gender-based violence in St. Martin? If this is not a policy that falls under ECYS, can you in kindly indicate under which ministry it directly falls, and does ECYS play a role in the development of this policy? This policy falls under the responsibility of the Ministry of VSA, and the response to the question is also being provided by that ministry. The following questions is from the, the Member of Parliament, MP Gomes. Through you, and in this case, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask the Minister what powers rest with the Inspectorate of Education currently, and what powers will they gain once it is approved and ratified to ensure that school boards and their relevant entities are following the law of the land, including schools' own requirements to report to the ministry. The inspectorate, as any citizen has, that has a suspicion of child abuse, has the responsibility to report cases of abuse to the court of guardianship. The following question, as well, Mr. Chairman, if the minister could share 
what other challenges face the Inspectorate of, Eca of Education in executing their role aside from the law. Other challenges the Inspectorate faces is in executing its role are the pending mandate as per Article 6 of the law on compulsory education, the pending ordinance on in education supervision, the training of truancy officers, which is the BOA, formerly known as BAFL um, certification. These are the challenges that now um, are there for the inspector of education. However, the, the, the ordinance, uh, the LBHAM, on the, on the supervision of compulsory education is nearing its ending of its, its trajectory and it will be soon ready to implement. To you, Mr. Chairman, to the minister, while it is not mandated for the school board to report to the ministry, specific, to the ministry specifically the Department of Education about the incident, the civil code, and the penal code both highlight the importance of reporting this incident to the Court of Guardianship. The minister has said that he involved the authorities, if I understood correctly, but is there any knowledge that the school board went through this process? If not, would they be held accountable for not reporting this incident to the relevant authorities? As indicated before, I am not aware if the school board went through the process. The following question. And finally, Mr. Chairman, can the minister inform if in upcoming legislation, whether amendments or otherwise, there will be penalties to alternative school boards that are repeat offenders for not reporting and transparently, resolve, transparently resolving cases such as this in particular regarding their subsidy. In the ministerial administrative decrees issued to the various school boards under Article 2 sub 9, it states that the respective school boards is required to comply with the request of the Division of Inspection of the Ministry of Education, Culture and Sports, which is charged with the monitoring of the quality of education on behalf of the Minister of Education. There is an option for the Ministry to enforce a sanction on school boards by reducing its subsidy for not complying with its reporting obligation pending the ratification of the changes in the Lansford Ordining for Gazette Ombudsman. Then, Mr. Chairman, I go to the question from Member of Parliament, Westcott Williams. Does the UN right of the child supersede the St. Martin laws? The answer, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child does not supersede a country national laws. However, for countries that have ratified the CRC, which is the case for St. Martin, then the national laws are expected to be aligned with articles of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. The following question, what happened to all of the policies that were written in collaboration between youth and UNICEF. There were no policies written with the technical assistance of UNICEF Netherlands with the Department of Youth. Within the Child Resilience and Protection Project managed by UNICEF Netherlands, no activities as such, such no activities such as policy development are incorporated in the project. The technical support of UNICEF Netherlands is for policy implementation in certain aspects of the integrated youth policy, early childhood development policy, the guide towards a national protocol child abuse, and the safety net policy framework. Following question, in 2015, the 2015 action plan combating child abuse and the 2018 policy to prevent domestic violence and child abuse. Where, why were they not approved? The guide towards the National Protocol Child Abuse containing guidelines for the reporting and handling of child abuse and the action plan child abuse 
was approved in May 2015 by the Council of Ministers. The policy for combating domestic violence, child abuse, and gender-based violence falls under the responsibility of VSR, which I mentioned before, and the answer to this will be sent in writing. The law on higher education has been worked on before 101010. Um, what are the issues that it has not been completed as yet? Um, this answer has been given before, so the same answer um, remains. And then the question says, for the same for the law on education supervision, what are the issues? I believe I also gave that answer before. So there are no issues with the National Ordinance on Education Supervision. It has been broadly consulted by stakeholders, and it's now being revised and, you know, based on the feedback provided by the Department of Legal Affairs. The Netherlands has a youth law. Does the minister think that this is necessary and could be helpful in this regard? The Jeugdwet in the Netherlands regulates youth care services for youth and families in need of guidance. The Youth Care Act will ensure that qualitative care is made available to youth and their parents. Presently, St. Martin has no Youth Care Act. However, this is an idea cited in the integrated youth policy as a priority. In the view of the minister and those involved with child care, child abuse reporting, is there a need to be more specific in our penal code? Is there a need for a further definition? The synchronization of the national ordinance related to foundation-based education, the secondary education, and the compulsory education ordinance, and the matter of reporting are being taken up in the national ordinance for education supervision. Once the initiatives for, of the government in collaboration with UNICEF Netherlands and the strengthening, no. Once one of the initiative of the government in collaboration with UNICEF Netherlands is the Child Resist Resilience and Protection Project. This initiative would help identify and strengthen the internal reporting procedures within healthcare organizing organizations to quickly identify child abuse and provide support based on parental characteristics. The following question, what is the status of the 2015 action plan on child abuse? Was it approved or not? As mentioned earlier, the guides towards the national protocol child abuse containing guidelines for the reporting and handling of child abuse and the action plan child abuse was approved in 2015. The following question, what is the status of the 2018 policy to prevent domestic violence and child abuse? Was it approved or not? And if not, why are they not approved? So this question, as also indicated, would be provided by the Minister of Ministry of VSA, and I think it has been submitted, right? Yeah, yeah. It's being submitted to Parliament. The foundation-based education law and the secondary education law are being revised, and in it would come out stronger the matter of reporting. Wouldn't it be better, wouldn't it be a better approach to make the changes that have become apparently necessary as far as child abuse is concerned to make them ahead of the overall review of the law on FBE and secondary education? Would you deem it this necessary now at this time, Minister? Would this be necessary at this time? This is not necessary at this time. The synchronization of the national ordinance related to foundation-based education, secondary education, and compulsory education, and the matter of reporting are being taken up in the national ordinance for education supervision. Following question, looking at collaboration and cooperation with the Netherlands, the focus needs to be on this. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. 
as mentioned previously, the synchronization of the national ordinances, the matter of reporting, are being taken up in the National Ordinance for Education Supervision. The proposed legislation is currently being vetted by the Department of Legal Affairs. Once this process has concluded, the legislation will be forwarded to the Council of Advice for vetting and it will continue on the trajectory. The following question, where are the institutions and the task force? What are they doing? If policies were approved, is there a report on workings of the policies? Where did we fall short on these reports? The Inter-Country Task Force for Child Rights was set up on April 4, 2014 at the Kingdom-wide conference in Aruba. It consists of official representatives from the four countries of the kingdom and the three public entities of the Caribbean Netherlands and meets monthly. The task force include developing a shared vision, cooperation, knowledge sharing, monitoring, and advising political authorities. On November 20th, 2018, the countries and the public bodies strengthened their cooperation by signing a memorandum of understanding on the rights of the child with six priorities, namely, promote prevention and encourage positive parenting, prevent and reduce child abuse, develop safety nets with the local community, promote youth participation, ensure availability of professional help and support for, ch for children and families, which is youth care, and number six, provide assistance for vulnerable children, including migrant and disabled children. Each country or public body works on the six priorities and share knowledge on ways of cooperation in these areas. The task force holds an annual inter-country conference for parents, youth care professionals, policy work makers, and public administrators. Working with organizations such as UNICEF, the task force promotes steps to strengthen safety nets around children, raise awareness of children's rights, and increase youth participation. The task force itself does not have the function to develop or approve policies. As was mentioned earlier, this task force assignment is to develop a shared vision, cooperation, knowledge sharing, monitoring, and advising political authorities. Following question, can the minister explain in the case in question, how has it been handled? What exactly happened? Not the specifics, but in reporting responsibility, legal, morally. According to the Catholic School Board, according to the Catholic School Board, considering the nature of the complaint, an independent committee comprising of external experts in the following disciplines, legal, advisor, psychologist, and education specialist was installed to investigate the complaint. The Minister of VSR, the following question. The Minister of VSR and the Minister of Justice signed a policy to combat domestic violence, child abuse, and gender-based violence in July of 2021. What is slash was the role of the Ministry of ECYS in this policy? What is the policy all about? Does it answer some of the questions regarding the implementation, execution of the laws? The ministry made a contribution, so the Ministry of ECYS made a contribution to this policy through the resource document, the National Action Plan Child Abuse. This document was used for drafting the policy to combat domestic violence, child abuse, and gender-based violence. This policy falls under the responsibility of the Ministry of ASR. For the cl clarification regarding this option is also submitted to Parliament from the Ministry. And then I have the questions from Member of Parliament, Duncan. It is clear that there is at least a provision in the FBE ordinance to report incidents, but not in the secondary education ordinance. 
what will the ministry actively do now moving forward as it relates to incidents of this nature? In the interim phase, pending the ratification of the amendment to the law on secondary education, the ministry has discussed the matter with school boards to arrive at an interim solution in the interest of all concerned. A first draft of an agreement between the parties is being vetted internally, and once it is finalized, it will be shared with the school boards. What is being discussed with the school boards? Um, the spirit of the law, the intention of the law, the intention of the law that is now in draft form, so it is the school boards are being asked to ahead of time um, agree to to execute the spirit of the law and this 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 solution this draft has been made and it will be discussed with them and this happened since i have been in parliament can you spell out the current or the future procedure for both secondary and primary levels Article 8 of the Foundation-Based Education Ordinance establishes obligation to report violence and sexual offenses. The draft amendment of the Secondary Education Ordinance also include this in Article 4A and 4B. The article states as follows. One, if the competent authority has a reasonable suspicion that within the sphere of a school under its authority, a crime against morality as referred to in Title 14 of the Penal Code or the offense of serious assault referred to in Article 315 or 316 of that code has occurred against or has been committed by pupils, the director, teacher, other staff or persons otherwise under the authority or third parties, they shall immediately report this to an investigative officer as referred to in Article 184, first paragraph of the Article 185 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. In the event of involvement of students, the principal, a teacher, other staff or other persons under their authority, the competent authority will inform the parents or the person concerned before taking, making a report. If the competent authority has reasonable grounds to suspect that a person entrusted with duties on behalf of its school or other person has committed physical violence towards a student or against a person entrusted with duties on behalf of its school, the competent authority shall immediately report to an investigative officer as referred to in Article 184, first paragraph or Article 185 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Before making a report, the competent authority will inform the parents of the pupil concerned, the principal, or the relevant person entrusted with task on behalf of the school. Also, if a staff member not being the principal has a reasonable suspicion that a person entrusted with a task for the benefit of the school, not being the principal is guilty or has committed an offense as referred to in the first paragraph against a student of the school, the staff member immediately informs the director who in turn informs the competent authority without delay. Also, if a staff member has a reasonable suspicion that a director has committed an offense as referred to in the first or second paragraph against a student of the school, the staff member shall immediately inform the competent authority thereof. And finally, if a staff member is of the opinion that the competent authority has insufficiently compi complied with the obligations pursuant to this article, he shall immediately inform the minister stating the reason. The following question. Article 30 of the FBE, in the FBE ordinance speaks on the denial of teaching privileges. Does the minister believe that the teachers convicted of crimes 
should be allowed to be hired in the ministry in other positions. Although convictions of sexual misconduct are serious and the Ministry of Education does not take these cases lightly, all individuals convicted of a crime have the right to rehabilitation in the community as well as the right to employment. Offenders have the same right to seek employment as any other member of the community. On the other hand, there are certain circumstances where a person with a particular criminal record poses an unacceptable risk if he or she is employed in a particular position. As a result, teachers convicted of sexual misconduct can be hired in other areas of education sector if it is guaranteed that the individual will have no contact whatsoever with students. Following question. Will the minister give approval for the public dissemination of the State of Education report? And when can Parliament and the people of Saman receive the latest version? I know that the latest version is being prepared to be sent to Parliament and making the report public. I am busy looking into this aspect. Then I have the questions from Member of Parliament Pantaflet, MP Pantaflet, to you, Mr. Chairman. How are these cases handled on other islands in the kingdom? We are still busy with this answer, and uh, it will be sent to you in writing. And then the second question, how many of these incidents have been reported in the last five years? What took place and if there were court cases? This answer has also been submitted in writing to you. Thank you. Then I have questions and from the member of parliament, MP Bryson. Are parents reporting these cases? Is there action from parents? The answer given, to date, no formal complaints or reports regarding child abuse have been reported by parents. Parents. So, Minister of Justice has indicated that the Court of Guardian has limited resources. What is the current state of the Court of Guardianship and ability to help children and school, and school boards? What does the Court of Guardianship need from Parliament to, prop up, to, fun to function properly to conduct their work? Can Minister of ECYS consult with Minister of Justice and tell us what is the current state of the Court of Guardian and their ability to help students, parents, and school boards? Can we receive the report and help set a baseline as to what is to be expected as behavior. Again, my, Mr. Chairman, this answer has been um, consulted with the Ministry of Justice, and it is on its way, I think. These, this, all these questions have been compiled, and um, the report is there, the answers are there. I, you got through to send it? There were some challenges with the internet, but they are coming to the members of parliament. Uh, can the minister please send us a list of legal deficiencies between the secondary education law and the foundation-based education law? And can the minister outline in a chart what is missing from the laws and what action the minister or ministry is taking to merge this? For example, column A, FBE, column B, S, E, column C, what is missing? Now, this was done, and it is also sent to parliament. I hope it reached in writing, it is already done. There's a chart. There's a chart. Um, what was what table pre present presenting an overview? So that was done. How long has the amendment been worked on? When did drafting of this law begin? When did the minister review the law? When did legal affairs receive the law? And when will it? be done. So when is the deadline? The synchronization and the amendment of the 
education legislation begun in the second quarter of 2021. On Tuesday, May 3rd, 2022, the draft law was presented to the Department of Legal Affairs for vetting. After being vetted, any necessary changes will be implemented, and once the vetting stage has been completed, the legislation will be presented to the Council of Advice. Could Parliament receive an update on the legislation coming from the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports? Where are the laws in the process, and are they making progress? When will the legislation be completed? I have an oversight of seven legislative pieces, and most naturally one or two of them you have heard about before. Number one, the law on higher education, as, educa as indicated earlier, has been broadly consulted on review and advised upon by the Council of Advice, and another report has been drafted. It has been vetted by Yes at the way, and the final adjustment, as I indicated earlier, are being made in order to present this to Parliament for ratification. Then we have the law on education supervision, also indicated earlier, has been drafted and broadly consulted on, um, has been vetted by the Legal Affairs and Legislation Department, Legal Legislation Department, yes, at and way, and the final adjustments are being made to present the law to the Council of Advice for review. We also have the amendment and synchronization of the foundation-based education, secondary education, and a law on compulsory education. This also have been drafted, broadly consulted on, and has been vetted by the Legal Affairs and Legislation Department and yes, at and way. The final adjustments are being made to present the law to the Council of Advice for review. We also have the LBHAM regarding the supervision of compulsory education. Um, this has been reviewed by the Council of Advice. The NADA report has been drafted and was recently returned to the Legal Advice and Legislation Department. The NADA report will be presented to the Council of Ministers for the LBHAM to be ratified. We also have a ministerial regulation establishing the function of profiles of the ROA, that is the RAT van Onderwijs and Arbeid. It has been drafted, vetted by YZNV. The ministerial regulation will be presented to the Council of Advice within short. We have the National Decree for Study Financing. This has been drafted and vetted by the Legal Affairs and the legislation department, le final adjustments are being made to present the LBHAM to the Council of Advice. And then we have the national decree for the funding of education. This has, this has, uh, so this is a working draft on um, this will be, f which will be finalized once the law on higher education is completed. Then the following question, elucidate if the use of technology slash social media is planned to be or can be included in the scope of evidence or suspicions in the regulation, legislation, the context, using the use of social media to harass, groom, etc., evidence, pen pal, code, or FBE, or secondary education ordinance. For this answer, I refer to the answers of justice that we received in writing. Then I have the questions from the Member of Parliament, Peterson. Is there a specific central, central melt point as per Article 243A of Book 1 of the Civil Code for the anonymous reporting of child abuse or suspicions of cases of child abuse? If there is, then we should be active in informing the public of its existence and encouraging everyone to go report a situation when they become aware of it. I am aware that we have a melt point. I spoke with the minister. Um, this is more for the minister to reiterate um, this in his answer and inform the public according 
accordingly of its existence and how they can also contact them. Um, I know that any suspicion of abuse can be reported to the central telephone number of the Court of Guardian, which is 918. And there is also a 5 phone number, which I have somewhere there. I will mention in a while. Second question, in light of the central melt as per the law, Madam Chair, which is Ms. Mr. Chairman today, through you, I also want to ask the minister what are the specific bottlenecks to get the melt print working at a representable level. It is, is it funding? Does the Court of Guardian need to take action or does a separate department need to be established? Because if there was any budget amendment necessary, then that one should be one of our first priorities when the budget comes. And in this case, Mr. Chairman, I also refer to the answers provided by the Ministry of Justice. My question to you, Minister, through you, Mr. Chairman, is what is the school board, what did the school board do about this alleged situation? Was there indeed an agreement reached with the concerned teacher? And was it any part of that agreement to keep the matter outside of the public eye? I mentioned already what was done by the Catholic School Board, and I don't know of any agreements that was reached with any with the teacher. Mr. Chairman, this brings me to the end of the Mr. Chairman. This brings me to the end of the answers to the questions of the members of parliament and I await any follow-up questions. I thank you. Thank you, Minister. At this point, I look to the members of parliament. Does anyone wish to make use for a clarification? MP Rolando Bryson and MP Melissa Gums. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in the response to my question about whether um, any complaint has formally been filed. I know there's been some time since that question was posed and since um, the answer has been received. Just maybe if the minister could confirm and maybe generally tell us, uh, up until now, is this a cold case? Is this a closed case? Has there since been a, a, a complaint? Or what is the situation, let's say, today, as of today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have... Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have um, mentioned many times over and repeatedly that I contacted the authorities and they have stated the case has been handled. So for me, the case is closed. Thank you. And be Melissa Bounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Minister, for the responses. Regarding the, your answer to my question, though, about um, uh, whether amendments or so will there be penalties attached, you, uh, could you clarify the answer a bit for me? So could you repeat? Because I'm not clear as to whether the sanctions on subsidy for noncompliance exist already or if it's something that is pending and coming in the changes that, um, that you're working on. So if just get some clarity on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have any more clarifications? No, we don't. We'll adjourn for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in regards to the follow-up question from the Member of Parliament, Gums, the answer is, in the ministerial administrative decrees issued to the various school boards under Article 2 sub 9, it states that the respective school boards is required to comply with the request of the Division of Inspection of the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, which is charged with the monitoring of the quality of education on behalf of the Minister of Education. There is an option for the Ministry to enforce a sanction on the school board by reducing its subsidy for not complying with its reporting obligation pending the ratification of the changes in the Lansford Ordning for Gazet on the ways. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Members of Parliament, for those clarifications. I give the floor back to the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports, Dr. Anders Rudolph Samuel, to provide, no, no, sorry, 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 sorry. According to the speaker's list, I want to remind the speakers that they have 10 minutes in the second round. And according to the speaker's list, the first speaker is MP Angelique Rumu. No need, Mr. Chairman. No need. The next speaker, Melissa Gums. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no real need, just that I would ask if the minister could keep us up to date with um, what is pending, the explanation that he's given here today. And again, thank you for, um, for the answers. Thank you. Thank you, MP Gums. The next speaker, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. Mr. Chairman, I really don't have any need to speak in the second round. Because if I really look at how meetings such as these proceed, where we are today compared to where this meeting started off is um, a big difference. And I, I honestly, I don't, have, I don't have any further questions because by the time we do get the answers again, we're going to be weeks, maybe months from here. And I don't see, because I'm not getting it, I don't think that the people of St. Martin are getting a clear and concise response by government on the topic as it was put forward when we asked and started this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. The next speaker, MP Solange Duncan, no need. Following speaker, George Pantaflet. No need. The next speaker, MP Rolando Bryson, a little need. <laughs> um, what I think would be very helpful for the members of parliament, Mr. Chairman, especially from the Ministry of ECYS, if we can get some sort of a kind of, let's call it a legislative agenda um, that would give us, let's say for the next year, in terms of, you talk about tertiary, tertiary like education, you have then the, the, the um, subsidized schools, public schools, all of these different legislations. Can the minister provide us in writing uh, with a planning? I know you have to deal with council advice and so on, but set a goal and a sort of a agenda for over the next year. If you believe that you can get these legislation passed within the next term, well, let me be provided members of parliament with a path to how you think we can reach there. Um, because uh, a lot of different meetings, I'm noticing the minister mentioning, well, you know, I have this coming, I have that coming. Um, that, that is very anecdotal as opposed to the minister presenting to the members of parliament in writing, look, tertiary education, it's currently here, we want to maybe have it here. Set some type of parameters. I know you don't like to do that, minister, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, but it helps us as well. And, you know, you're going to get these questions every time you come. You're going to get it in the budget debate as well. Where's the tertiary education? Where's the, the changes to the school board? Where is this? Where's the changes to study financing? So provide it to us one time in writing. And hey, if you miss a date, members of parliament, I did say I wanted to have this law by December 1st. However, we have XYZ delays. 
expected maybe by January 10th. But give us that, Mr. Chairman, if the minister can give us that, I think that will help a lot specifically with the legislation that this parliament has been yearning from to get from this ministry. Tertiary education, scholarships, school boards, and public education laws. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP. The following speaker would have been Rayon Peterson, MP Peterson, but he is not present. And Minister, would you like to respond now or would you? Yes, the Minister would respond now to the observations. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me say thank you to the members of parliament that made um, their remarks um, towards this topic. And I would like to say that indeed, from the time we started to now, the situation is, is totally um, in a different phase. Um, what is also good to reiterate that I have met with the school boards and knowing that we are busy with the amending of the ordinance in order to make reporting stronger, that we have discussed, so myself and the school board, to look at the spirit of the law. And ahead of the law, you know, t being ratified, taking place, which might take a while, that we make an agreement with each other to uphold the spirit of the law, meaning that we would agree between the stakeholders that the law intends to do reporting and we would do the reporting until the law is completed. So this is a, a very good um, advancement. I think it is good for the people to know that we the, the issue was not just left alone, but a follow-up has taken place um, that the authorities indicate that the case has been handled, that's it, Mr. Chairman. Once the authorities say they have handled it, it is closed. And that's the situation um, for this case. In regards to the planning, which was um, requested or asked for again by the Member of Parliament, Bryson, I would like to indicate that with legislation, it is so challenging to indicate when it will be here in Parliament. I know in my, you know, former years as a member of the Parliament of the Netherlands Antilles, there were some pieces of legislation that took five to ten years to get to Parliament. And when I look at, for instance, the El Beham, on the supervision of compulsory education and the time it took by the legal affairs department, I find it is long. But when you take into consideration um, the same personnel that has to deal with the laws from ECYS have to also deal with other legal things from the rest of the government. And it can be so that delays will take place. So while I have given you today as you have asked, uh, outlay of the legislations that we are busy with. To add to it what date I think it will reach Parliament, I don't know. I really thought when it comes to the law on higher education, from the moment I stepped in the office as Minister of Education, this was one of the first ordinances that I requested. How can we work on this? piece of legislation and get it ready. And since then, it has moved through the trajectory. And I said before, and I can say again, and it is the same thing, it's on its last leg. But yet, it isn't by parliament. Then you have, indeed, the amendment and the synchronization, which started in 2021 of this, this, this ordinance that we are talking about. We did not wait until something happened. Um, this was already recognized. Also remember when we had an incident that we went to a school and we were told, oh, you can't come here because this is a private institution. To make these things um, available that the Minister of Education have some teeth, we have started 
and we are on the way, but it isn't finished. Um, the ministerial regulation regulating the function profile of the Council of Advice and, and Education is also such an organization that needs to be put in place, and we are busy with it. Um, so to, to indicate, it is a challenge to indicate when a certain department will be finished with a piece of legislation. And when you think they are done, when the legal affairs send you the, the, the answer to your question, you still have to send back and adjust, and then they can go back and forth in order to make sure that the piece of legislation that you're working on is thorough. So, Mr. Chairman, I will do my best in order to indicate a, a, a roadmap, so to speak, and then I will send it to the Parliament via you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the departments um, for their assistance in this matter because you know the work still has to be done by the departments. I want to thank my support team this afternoon and all the others who are behind the scenes on a distance digitally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Minister. I see, Mr. Bryson, you have a clarification. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got worried. I see the minister saying goodbye and, and, and thanks and so on, but I still have some clarification, Mr. Chairman, because, um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we recently handled a law here in Parliament where I pointed out that the Council of Advice gave a very clear um, approval of that law, which was to pay the civil servants to come despite it having legislatsi achteraf. And when I hear the minister saying, hey, you know what, in the spirit of the law, if some people could start implementing it, I would like the minister to clarify that, that he's not talking about legislation after the fact. Um, is there another legal instrument, a policy or MBA or something? Can you please clarify that? Because it worries me if the intention is, well, go ahead and start implementing this because the law coming. What if the law doesn't pass parliament? What if we change it? You know, we have... Many people in here that would probably have a lot to say about that piece of legislation. So maybe if the minister can clarify that part, because I would ask him to be a bit cautious in that regard, considering what the council advice recently advised this parliament and the government. Um, regarding legislation, um, Mr. Chairman, can the minister clarify uh, what other alternatives he may have available to him outside of the legal affairs department? Can there be... Uh, 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 an external legal support or something because there must be a way. I understand very well the backlog at legal affairs and if everybody is sending their legislation to legal affairs to get it done, um, you're, you're going to end up indeed with five, ten years for legislation. You have, for example, your colleague, the Minister of Finance, who saw that roadblock with the financial statements and as he explained to the Parliament, he got external advisors, he got a specific team within the the, 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 the finance ministry to work just on that. I know that's hard because everybody has to work on things, but this, these laws are so important. You, you have highlighted the importance. So can the minister indicate, do you have any other alternative to reach this goal of getting this legislation to parliament other than legal affairs? Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, MP Bryson. I give the floor now back to the minister who will respond to the request for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, indeed, um, the comments or the indication from the Member of Parliament is in place. What I want to explain is the following. An incident took place and in, on the island in a school, and we noticed that there were not sufficient legal um, foundation to compel the reporting. However, because we are busy with the amendment to the legislation that will make it possible, 
and we have consulted the stakeholders, which are the school boards, so they are also part of the development of that piece of legislation. The question to them is, are they willing in the spirit of the law, so or as an agreement between each other, or between us, voluntarily, voluntarily, on behalf of the people of St. Martin, and to indicate that as a school board, you care and you want to give the community a measure of understanding that we are here to, to do right by our students, if they are willing voluntarily to sign an agreement, which is a memorandum of understanding or an agreement to say, look, this is what the law would like us to do, but until the law is in place, we will agree to do this together as a as a education family. That is that is the premise. And um, the the second part of looking outside of the the government for assistance, um, if that is really really necessary, I think I will look into that. But for now, Mr. Chairman, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Dr. Anders Samuel. Thank you, members of Parliament. I would like to thank the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports, and his support staff for their presence here this afternoon and for providing the necessary information and clarity. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this meeting. I thank you all for your participation and I hereby close this public meeting.